Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, hi. Welcome to uh, MDIS SLS Virtual Fair. So today we have here our alumni, uh, Dr. Larry Lu. He just Hello, recently hi. graduated from his uh, PhD program. Um, in reality, today is supposed to be his uh, virtual graduation, but he's here with us to give his available time uh, for an interview. Okay, um, Larry, thank you so much for taking this time to come, come and uh, come and uh, give us this interview. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of questions that our uh, viewers would like to know. So we, um, they, some have asked, what inspired you to seek a career in the life sciences? Okay, so thank you everyone for attending this seminar and thank you MDIS for inviting me back to give this talk. So what really inspired me in my career in the life science is that uh, I was uh, very passionate about science uh, since I was young in primary school. I remember that in the, the Singapore Science Centre had this initiative called the uh, Young Scientist Badges. So for every primary school children, you are required to complete a certain set of uh, mini science projects, after which you will be awarded with these uh, mini science badges. And I was uh, collecting a lot of these young scientist badges. So I guess that my passion in science was quite evident since young. And I've always been enjoying uh, Mother Nature, hiking and uh, trekking outdoors. And so when the opportunity for me came to specialize uh, in my career, I chose to enroll in the MDIS School of Life Science in 2009. So um, the, the audience would also like to know, um, do you encounter any obstacles in your life science learning journey? And, well, yeah. And, and if so, how, how do you overcome it? Well, definitely there will be a lot of obstacles. So a couple of obstacles are like, for example, trying to keep up with the scientific literature. There are so many hard papers being published nowadays that I have to like keep scrolling through the PubMed database to keep myself updated. Mm -hmm. And the other obstacle is uh, trying to also uh, uh, work very hard to, to, you know, to be on par with the others as well. So how did I uh, overcome this obstacle is I try to make many friends. So especially make friends who are smarter than me so that I can consult them with, uh, when I have questions with regards to any homework or assignment that I might have. And the other important thing is that to work really, really hard so passion, science is my passion. So working hard for me, uh, it's quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a natural process as well. Yeah. So um, you made a lot of friends. Uh, you like the, the science journey. So what made you choose to further your studies in MDIS as your uh, institution of choice? Well, back then in 2009, I was looking around for schools to enroll in for my undergraduate degree. So MDIS had a very strong program in the biomedical science back then in 2009 with the collaboration with the University of Bradford. So it was a direct three years honors program and allows its uh, participants to carry on to graduate studies right after the undergraduate uh, studies. So uh, if you walk around in MDIS campus back then and now, you will realize that it is really an international learning environment. I made a lot of friends from all around the world, such as China, Vietnam, US, UK, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. So I was really, um, really, I really like the kind of international learning environment. So I thought that MDIS is the best choice for me. So I enrolled in MDIS back then. So um, MDIS was the, uh, was your favorite destination because there's a lot of um, international students who you can interact with. Definitely. So, um, how, how did MBIs prepare you for uh, a research intensive course such as the PhD program? Well, MBIs prepared me very well for the research intensive course such as a PhD. So uh, I had very dedicated lecturer. So these lecturers come from a wide variety of backgrounds. I could remember that one of them was the head of the Health Science Authority in Singapore, Dr. Christopher Sin. So when you have lecturers who have so much experience, so the student will naturally gain a lot of experience on how to, uh, how to proceed on to a better career, like for me pursuing a PhD. And to pursue a PhD, you have to go for some sort of like undergraduate internship. And I also had the lecturers who volunteered to write a recommendations letter for me as well. And I guess that one of the key criteria in the, to enroll into a PhD is really the recommendations that you can get from your professors and lecturers. So um, you had an enjoyable um, learning experience, but what were the difficulties that you had uh, when you undertook the PhD program? 
I think there are a few difficulties. I guess one of the main difficulty is that you don't you go in with the mindset of an undergraduate. You are most likely not be able to to make it. So in the postgraduate PhD program, you are required to study everything from the textbooks, the scientific literature, and then come up with new ways of synthesizing this new knowledge and then publish them as an original article in the journal. So that is really one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, trying to come up with new knowledge or to challenge current existing theories. That was one of the main difficulty. The other difficulty is also to approach it a PhD journey like a marathon. So you have to pace yourself and not be burned out because you are most likely going to do a lot of experiments every day and a lot of these experiments are going to fail. I guess that probably half, 50% of the experiments I perform fail, but every step I fail bring me one step forward to uh, contributing to something in the scientific uh, journey. I can really truly empathize with you yeah. because I have my, my own share of um, failures and experiments that I might do. Okay, so um, uh, one final question for you. Yeah. Uh, what were the high points in, in your PhD program? Well, I guess that the high point was, was that I was able to uh, contribute to the five uh, original publication articles in uh, top journals. And also I led teams and won some biotech competition uh, prizes uh, overseas and locally as well. Those were the really high points. I was able to also serve uh, in the Biotech Connection Singapore and the A-Star Scholars Network contributing to the life science community. So in short, I had a wonderful journey in my, uh, uh, as a, uh, doing my PhD at A-Star. Okay, um, so that concludes our interview. So um, could you give us your, your presentation on the um, transforming trends in life sciences to see what kind of um, trends are available in the industry and academia? Sure, definitely. Oh, I press this right. Yes. So I can start. Yes. So hello everyone. Today I'm going to give a talk on the transforming trends in the life sciences. A short introduction about me. I've always been passionate about science since young, having a great science teacher as the role model. And my ambition was to be a scientist and an educator. My motivation is to inspire future generations of young scientists. So as mentioned, I am enrolled in MDIS School of Life Science in 2009 and I made wonderful friends from around the world. I had the strong, ac excellent academic support uh, for students from the lecturers and also the admin staff here at MDIS, and I'm very, very grateful for that. After that, I enrolled in NTU Masters for, uh, for my Masters, and was subsequently awarded the A-Star Graduate Scholarship in 2015 to pursue my PhD in stem cell biology and diabetes. I then graduated in May 2020, which is very recently, contributing to five papers and two biotech competition awards. I also had the fortune of serving on the Biotech Connection Singapore and A-Star Scholars Network as a general committee member. Right now, I would like to talk about the advances in life sciences over the past few centuries. So from the 16th to 19th centuries, we saw a couple of groundbreaking theories being uh, raised. Scientists as a profession was first coined in 1833, we discovered Darwin theory of evolution, germ theory of disease, and cell theory. And this led to several more breakthroughs in the 20th centuries. Watson and Crick discovered a DNA double helix structure and solved it. The invention of the PCR, DNA amplification, won the Nobel Prize in 1993. We had the first clone animal, Dolly the sheep, and also discovered the first stem cells. In the 21st century, things began to heat up more. The human race completed the first human genome project, ushering in several advent of more generation, next generation sequencing technologies. The discoveries of induced pluripotent stem cells won the Nobel Prize in 2012, and we also saw advances in genetic engineering. Well, in order to create all this gen gen uh, breakthrough, scientists have to use many kinds of lab techniques in the life sciences, such as DNA RNA purification, PCR, cell culture techniques, molecular biology assay, RNA sequencing and chip sequencing, and also siRNA and RNA interference. Of course, there are too many other techniques to be listed here. 
However, now the question we ask is, are these lab techniques still relevant and sufficient to fighting diseases in the 21st century? Apparently, no. David J. Hunter, a Richard Dahl professor at the University of Oxford, said that we are fighting a 21st century disease with 20th century weapon. So all most of these uh, lab techniques have, are currently in the midst of being outdated. So there's an imperative need to come up with better lab techniques and also innovation in life sciences to deal with uh, pandemics such as COVID-19. This will allow us to understand and answer questions like why are elderly more susceptible to COVID-19 infections? Can we cure cancers? And can we cure diabetes using pl human pluripotent stem cells? I'd like to share a couple of our recent innovation in the life sciences with you all. One example would be the CAR T cells. These are chimeric antigen T cells specifically engineered to attack cancer cells in the human bodies. So you collect the blood from the human patients and you isolate the T cells. You then specifically engineer these receptors on the T cells, allowing them to attack cancer cells in the body. You then multiply and expand them in a culture dish and you reinfuse them back into the human patients. How powerful is this technology? Well, look at this uh, little girl, Erin Cross, age seven, from the United Kingdom. So she has been in, out of, in and out of hospital since the age of two, having a chemotherapy uh, sessions for her, her cancer. However, the cancer has always been relapsing and there was no cure for her. At the last resort, Erin uh, opted her to receive this CAR T cell therapy in 2018. And since then, she has been cancer free. In, the cancer has been remission since then. The advantage of this CAR T cell therapy is that it has very short treatment time, around two to three weeks, and it has the potential to replace chemotherapy as a conventional treatment. The recent, second re recent innovation in life sciences is the CRISPR, also known as the Clustered Regularly Interspace Short Palindromic Repeats, which is used for gene editing. Well, in June, just last month, three people with the sickle cell anemia has been successfully treated with CRISPR. Sickle cell anemia is a disease whereby there is a mutation in the beta globin gene resulting in the red blood cell having this sickle cell shape. So it is unable to carry oxygen effectively. So using CRISPR, they are able to replace this defective copy of the beta globin gene with a functional copy. And the body stem cells are then able to produce the normal red blood cells Cure, resulting in a cure for these patients. However, this uh, CRISPR can be abused as well. So in uh, three years ago, I think two, three years ago, this, uh, Chris, this CRISPR scientist was sentenced to jail in China for trying to illegally modify the human embryos using this CRISPR technology. They set out to initially disable, to use CRISPR to disable this uh, CCR5 gene. But ultimately, due to some uh, technical problems and some sloppiness in the research, not only did they fail to do so, but the, there was also some unintended effects such as resulting in the embryos, the babies having a shortened lifespan. So this is, uh, this is uh, one of the sad case in the science as well. However, the CRISPR technology is still very promising. The discoverers of this technology are widely speculated to win a Nobel Prize. And However, the scientific community believes that there, there should be a tighter control of this CRISPR technology in the human embryos. The final one that I'll share is the human pluripotent stem cells that can be used to generate the tissues, organoids, and or even entire organs. So in order to obtain human pluripotent stem cells, you can extract these uh, somatic cells such as the fibroblasts from the human patients and reprogram them back into iPS cells using a variety uh, cocktail of genes, such as OC4, SOX2, NANOC, and KLF4. You can then differentiate, differentiate them into the neural cells, muscle cells, blood cells, bone cells. So during my PhD studies, I was focused on differentiating these iPS cells into the insulin-positive beta-like cells. So this could effectively be uh, a treatment for type 1 diabetes in the very far future. The regeneration of human tissues from human pluripotent stem cell is already possible. Right now, the next challenge is that we need to assemble these cells, tissue into 3D structure of organoids and organ in order to mimic the in vivo environment. So I believe that this recent innovation in life science overview will be able to give you a more clearer picture on where life science is heading. And I believe the future is very bright for people who are intending on pursuing a career in the life sciences as well. 
So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to accept them. So otherwise, you can contact me at this uh, email below. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Larry. Um, thank you for your full presentation. Now we have a, a better understanding of your research and the, um, and the field of um, stem cells. So there's hope for diabetic patients and other pa patients with um, uh, metabolic diseases. Okay, so now we have our Q&A session. We'll open the Q&A session to our um, friends or viewers. Um, do you have any questions for uh, Dr. Lu? Okay, there's one uh, private message. Um, Dr. Lu, what is the... Um, in your, in your experience, what is the best um, PhD system in, in the world? Well, let me share with you uh, two kinds of PhD system, the US versus the Europe system. So in the US system, PhD tend to take a couple of years longer, for it's average around five to six years. This is because during their first two years, they are trying to, uh, the first two years, they are trying to come up with a scientific project uh, to, to, to do their research in, and they are mostly trying to take, undertake some uh, teaching duties as well. But for a U PhD in the UK system, more or less the project is already defined by the professor during the first year. So that's why it's taking a shorter time, uh, around three years. So if you, are, if you are more focused on having a shorter PhD, so it's best to head to the Europe, UK, where the PhD is much shorter as well. But if you like to have a more comprehensive experience, especially when uh, you are more focused on the ranking of universities, I believe that US is still the best place that you should be heading towards too. Because right now, you can see that majority of the Nobel Prize winners are still from the United States and the United States universities are still ranking very high. Uh, number one, I think is still Harvard on, or MIT as well. Yeah. That's interesting. So uh, some more questions from the audience. Um, from Laura, what do you think makes a successful biomed undergraduate? So what do I think makes a successful biomed undergraduate? Well, first of all, from my experience, from my previous experience in MDIS, one of the, if you ever could choose one criteria, that would be to work really, really hard. Because I've seen that some of my classmates, they are very smart, but they don't put in enough effort. So for me, I don't consider myself that smart but I work really hard. For example, during after classes, I would be peppering the lecturers with a lot of questions. And often I will also email them whenever I have any uh, problems with my assignments and homework as well. So I'm sure that hard work will not only make you a successful biomed undergraduate, but it will make you a success in all other areas of life as well. After I finish my honors degree, do I continue to do my master's or just continue to do my PhD? Or do I do work and gain experience? Uh, thank you for this question. So after you finish your honors degree, well, for people who are not sure whether they want to do a PhD, they can opt to do a master's first. I would say that a master's is more like a short-term PhD, which allows you to gauge whether you, are, you have the interest and passion to go for a PhD. On, on the other hand, you can choose to do a PhD first uh, right after your undergraduate studies. But I do have to say that several people who have done that might not, might find that have doing a PhD right after their undergraduate is not suitable for them. So in, eventually they drop out of the system. And for the third case is that you can, you can start working first uh, and gain experience because your work experience will count towards during your interview in the PhD program as well. And the most important thing is also, I mentioned, is the reference letter. If you have some uh, good working experience, your professors or some, uh, your employers will be able to write very good referral letter for you. And this will score you a lot of points during the PhD interview. So uh, one more uh, private question. Uh, so what would, be, what would be the cost of a PhD program? Is it going to be more expensive than the undergrad? Uh, program? Well, for the PhD program, so for me, I was under the A-Star Graduate Scholarship. So everything was funded by the Singapore government. 
I'm not quite sure about the cost, but I believe that it should be slightly more expensive than the undergraduate cost in NTU. And I understand that uh, most PhDs are actually funded through um, scholarships yes. or through the um, lab, um, the, the, P, the principal investigators' uh, lab funds. Okay, uh, another question. Um, there's about three months before October intake. So how can one better prepare to study biomedical sciences? What books or scientific journals should I read? Well, if you have three months before the October intake, what I recommend you is to read your school lecture notes first. So if you start looking, reading the scientific journals, I'm afraid that it will be very complicated because they are assuming that readers of these scientific journals have already a certain levels of knowledge. As an incoming undergraduate, I suggest you start looking at uh, the school lecture notes because they are more uh, simple and more concise. After you build up your knowledge from reading the lecture notes, then you can start moving to more complicated stuff such as, I would recommend you this uh, book called The Molecular Biology of the Cell, which is one of the main textbooks that every molecular biology student would use in their course. And I uh, also recommend um, for, for you to read um, textbooks such as um, molecular bio or um, biochemistry and maybe genetics because these are the three core these are the three core modules which will be covered in the biomedical course and if you're really uh, really in, into hardcore reading then take up a book that's on um, clinical diagnostics okay next um, I'm a biotech student now IT Will it be a struggle for me when I enter the foundation diploma in biomedical school? Okay, I'll answer this. Um, um, it will not be a struggle for you um, it, in the foundation diploma because this is uh, um, this just lays a foundation for you for entry into the degree program. Um, you'll be slightly you'll be paced you'll be paced slightly faster than ITE, but you'll be not so intense as the diploma courses in Singapore, but it has to be of a certain level of um, difficulty um, that is um, somewhere between the A levels and, and the diploma levels. So don't worry about that. Even though it's an intensive seven month course, um, you have a lot of support from your lecturers, the school and your classmates. So it will be an enjoyable uh, study, studying journey for you. Uh, what key skills do you think are crucial for biomed graduates? Or what key skills will I gain from this course? Well, for biomed graduates, you're going to pick up a lot of um, laboratory skills, especially in uh, molecular biology. You learn how to um, perform a lot of um, tasks. Uh, for example, um, PCR. Um, you learn how to do cell culture. You learn how to... Um, do staining for bacteria to identify the strains. So these are these are the um, these are the basic um, skills that you pick up in the lab along the way. Okay. Uh, what are the more difficult modules for the three year? Who are those who are likely to drop out or cannot overcome challenges to this rigorous course? Um, the the more difficult modules would be the cl the clinical uh, modules where we learn more about the human diseases. So even though it's not as rigorous as a medical course, but there is a certain rigor to it such that it, it um, raises your understanding of the disease to a, to a higher level. So it requires you to have a lot of um, background reading and uh, it requires you to, to internalize and integrate all the information and you are being tested by writing essays and and doing projects in terms of um, poster creations. So, so these are the type of uh, coursework that you are supposed to be doing in a course. So um, those people who those people who tend to drop out, they tend to have difficulty in um, in the foundation in their foundations because they um, they haven't read very widely and they um, find it difficult to integrate all the information that's given to them. Okay, uh, well, the questions are coming fast and furious. Uh, 
okay, how many exams or weighted assignments will there be in the foundation diploma course? Okay, so for the foundation diploma, there's going to be a total of 12 modules. And in each module, there's at least uh, three, there's going to be two, two to three assessments for um, assignments followed by two, as, two assessments. That means they test. So on average, you're going to have a total of five, five to six um, ways of uh, assessing each module in the diploma course. Okay, the recommended book. Um, the title was the molecular cell, molecular biology of the cell, molecular biology of the cell. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the recording uh, we will try to share with you. Um, you could obtain it from the consultants uh, once we have uh, obtained the recording because the recording has to be compressed after uh, after the recording ends. So you're going to take some time. I, I, we we can't give it to you immediately because of this issue. What's the percentage of passes for an honors degree from the school? Well, the passing rate is uh, the passing rate is about eighty to ninety percent, and forty to fifty percent of the students obtain good honors. That means a second upper to a first class honors. Okay, uh, does a first year undergrad get a chance to work with a mentor? or a senior undergrad? Okay, does a first year undergrad get a chance to work with a mentor or a senior undergrad? Um, um, in this, um, currently we don't have such an, such a, such an arrangement of um, seniors mentoring uh, juniors because there is no course that requires such, a, such an arrangement. Okay, the other recommended book journal, not this title, you just said, um, um, what, what I mentioned was the generic, um, generic title or rather the, the, um, the generic subjects you should be looking at. So it's um, molecular biology, cell biology, and genetics. And if you are really hardcore into biomed, you can look, look up textbooks that focus on clinical diagnostics. Okay. Uh, Veronica, I hope I have uh, answered your questions about the book. The research project in year three is like, Okay, uh, the research project in the year three is, is very, very varied. It depends on the lecturer who is um, uh, supervising you because it is his project. So the project can be as diverse as um, uh, microbiology. Um, you discover the microbes from, from samples that you obtain around you, um, from the soil, from the water, uh, from your food to see what kind of what kind of microbes um, exist in, in, the, in these uh, samples. Or you, you can even look at, I have another lecturer who's looking at the um, contamination of seafood so you, so, and, and marine life. So you'll be testing the um, seafood samples for the various contaminants, uh, industrial contaminants, chemical contaminants, and ex in order to assess the overall health of the waters around Singapore. Okay. All right. Uh, what is your experience with undergrad who are IB diploma students? Are they different from A levels or poly graduates? Um, my experience um, it is is quite um, scanty because I've only encountered one or two IB students, but I find that the IB students they tend to be uh, more vocal, they have better oratorical skills, they relate better and communicate better compared to the A-levels and polygrads. I, I think it has something to do with how they are being taught in the IB curriculum. Okay. Uh, waiting for the next question.
Um, at the moment, we don't have an internship program um, for our degree. Our, our degree programs, they are three-year um, direct honours. As compared to NUS, you need to do a three years undergrad before you go to your fourth year, which is your honours year. So um, we are actually planning to um, include an internship um, year, which is called the industrial placement year. And um, we, we are in the midst of planning for it. So it may be implemented in the next intake um, in 2021. How much of math is required to succeed? Oh, uh, if you are having A level, A level maths, uh, math C, or um, um, what is required is a pass. For if you have A levels, the requirement for entry into the North Umbria degree program is a uh, triple B. When one of the B, one of B's must be biology. Okay, so I hope uh, that allays some of the fears of people who are challenged in maths. Going for the next question. Okay, there's uh, one more question. One more, one more question. Um, is there? Okay, one. If I am entering with a high NITEC, how much MET do I require? Mm. Um, um, Humaira, it's difficult to answer your question right now. Um, but METs is not a, it's not a very um, high priority subject. As long as you have a pass in your MET subject, I think it should be fine. What is, what is important is that you have a biology subject or biology related subject. Um, for example, um, biology at all, at, um, uh, if you have biology or bio, biochemistry kind of um, related subjects. And for your NITEC, I, I, if you have a NITEC cert, I would suggest that you go to, um, go to the um, International Foundation Diploma first for seven months before you apply for the degree course. Okay, how does this honors degree stand in the job market in Singapore? Do employers value it as much as degree from NUS? Well, um, the honors degree is um, awarded by a UK institution. Then the, on, the NUS honors degree is awarded locally. So that is the, that's the main difference. So for employers, it should not make a, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be an issue because um, ours is not a long distance, um, not a long distance learning um, degree. It is a full time on campus and um, full time on campus um, learning learning program. So the honors degree that you obtain stands as as good as the honors degree from NUS. Ah uh, yeah, sure. So uh, many of my classmates who graduated from the same batch as me are actually employed in the institutions such as the Duke NUS, NUS and NTU. So in fact, you can find some of them in A-Star as well. Some of them have gone even better to do a, a PhD, a master's program overseas in the UK as well. So this goes to show that uh, there is definitely a certain amount of recognition given to this honors degree from UK and the MDRS. So you shouldn't have to worry about this. Okay, waiting for the next question. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Veronica. I just hope that it's been um, informational for, for you to make your decisions.
Okay, um, if there's no more questions, then we'll uh, carry on. We'll, uh, uh, you're welcome, Humaira. Now we'll look at what the, uh, oh, uh, one more question. What job offers are there if I graduate from BSc Biomedical Science? Uh, for biomedical science um, graduates, the, the industry is very wide, very diverse. You can, you, can, um, you can take up a job as a medical technologist in the hospital labs, the hospital diagnostic labs. They are the people who conduct all the um, uh, specimen tests for the doctors and they will generate the results, which will be interpreted by the doctors. Or you can be working in the research labs as a research officer in uh, ASTAR. Or you can even work in the biopharmaceutical um, companies in the production line in producing drugs, uh, vaccines, biologics. Or you can even go into uh, agri-tech um, as, a, as a technician managing the high-tech farms. So these high-tech farms will be indoors. It's no longer the traditional farm that you work under hot sun and uh, getting yourself dirty water mark. Now these farms, they are high-tech, indoors with uh, well-maintained um, humidity, climate control, is air conditioned, is the uh, nice 24, 25 degrees. But it requires a lot of expertise. You need to be specialized in learning how to um, man all the machines, how to um, troubleshoot the machines and how to formulate the feed for the animals and formulate the um, fertilizers for the plants. Yeah, and there's no need to worry about job offers. You see in the current uh, situation, like the COVID-19 pandemic, there are still a lot of hospitals and uh, institutions trying to hire biomedical science graduates to screen for the COVID-19. Uh, you can check that out on the job street, jobstv.com. They are still hiring. They are still hiring a lot of biomedical science graduates. Okay. Uh, what are the chances for me to venture into medicine to be a doctor after my master's degree? Is it a possibility? Um, yes, it, you, can, you can apply to be a doctor after your master's degree. Uh, it's usually to those labs with uh, those um, medical schools which, which offer uh, the medical course as a postgrad degree. The one example in Singapore is actually the Duke NUS. It's a, a postgrad degree. Uh, or, okay. With me, I graduated from Nanyang Poly with a diploma in biomedical engineering. May I know if I start in year one or year two? Um, um, you. For, for you, you have to submit your transcript to us to see if the modules that you've taken allow you to be granted uh, exemptions from the first year courses. So it's difficult for me to say right now if you can start in year one, year two. Um, so, um, if you have a diploma in, well, the exemptions would mainly be for, for, for the applicants who have taken um, anatomy, physiology, those would be the usual exemptions. Okay. Um, no, we don't have uh, the student, uh, mentoring a student um, system in uh, MDIS because there is no requirement. But you can set up your own informal um, uh, senior mentoring junior groups. It's, it's, um, you, you, you can do it. You can join the Biognosy bio, bio uh, Student Club and you, you can meet the um, students from the final year, second year, and they can give you a lot of advice and um, mentoring if, if, you need, if you need them. It's called Biognosy Club, B-I-O-G-N-O-S-Y, C-L-U-B, Biognosy Club. It is the uh, MDIS SLS Students Club. How is the school time schedule like at MDIS? How is life at MDIS Life Science? Okay, um, MDIS School of Life Sciences is, um, 
it's not an easy place to be because the timetable schedule is very packed because of the number of modules that you have to take and the amount of assignments that you have to complete. So I have to be very upfront, um, upfront frank with you. It's not going to be an easy task coming here because your time schedule will be spent in school almost all the time. Well, now you don't come to school, you do your school at home. So your time will be all filled up with um, lectures, um, seminars, practicals, discussion groups, and project work. So it's going to be very, very intense. And it's going to be very, very fulfilling for you at the end of the course. Okay, and um, our consultant has just uh, given you our schedule. It's uh, daily, 8.30 to 6.30 p.m., Mondays to Fridays. And every lecture, every, um, every um, class session is three hours long. So you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared to sit through a three hour long lecture or a three hour long practical. Okay, I think we have uh, time for one more question. For one more question. One last question from the audience. Okay, if experiments fail, students can just use the lab. If experiments fail, students can just use the lab within operating hours. Um, yes, the, the labs will only be op only for students who use during the um, office hours, 8.30 to 6.30 daily. And if there is uh, night classes, which, uh, which um, occurs from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., then the students can use the lab with permission. The, the principle is that students are not supposed to work um, alone in the labs. They must be working in the lab with um, supervision nearby. That means the lab text must be within the lab or within reach. Students cannot come into the lab alone this is for their safety and for everybody's safety. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. So now that we have done all the questions and answers, let's look at what the lecturers over at uh, NU have been doing for their research. I think this is uh, of interest to you. So I'll be highlighting the interviews um, from two um, lectures, one from the biomedical sciences and the other from the biotech sciences. To share the computer sound. My name is Dr. Stereos Moskos. I'm an associate professor of cellular and molecular sciences at the Department of Applied Sciences here at Northumbria University. The biggest single challenge facing the world today is literally the battle between humans and pathogens. My particular interest is especially the lung and the liver. I have in the past worked a lot with diseases such as hepatitis C virus, trying to get single shot gene therapies that can prevent people from getting the disease or treat those that have it. So my research looks at both how do we treat these genetic diseases and how do we change the genetic behavior of our organism to respond to non-genetic diseases, but also how do we measure what's happening in the organism at the same place and at the same time. I think it's crucial that research, any kind of research, be it in drama or diagnostics, it's, it's really important that whatever we do actually is translated into something that has an effect in society and economy. I bring my research into my teaching in every opportunity that I get. It's an old adage that repetition is the mother of all learning, but in my experience it's practice and actually feeling what you're doing with your hands that lets you learn what is happening out there. My personal preference is not for people who can reproduce knowledge word for word as it's written in a textbook, 
But I think the people that can tackle a question, a problem, based on the concepts and the ideas they have acquired from reading the textbooks, those are the individuals that will go out there in society, in jobs, in research, and deliver the improvements to the businesses that they work on, or the breakthroughs in basic research that they will engage with in the future. The students that I work with, be they PhD students, master students, or undergraduate students, if they are placed into my lab because they choose one of my projects, they will be 100% involved with active research that I have. In fact, come to think of my last few publications, there's not been a single one of them that hasn't included somebody who has been either at master's level, PhD level, and on occasion, undergraduate level as well. My approach is to transform minds. My approach is to, to look at individuals, how they come out of high school A-levels, whatever background BTECs that come into university, get them to assimilate knowledge and understand how to make connections between knowledge so that they can build upon this and grow something out of their own understanding. So my name is, is Gary Black. I am a professor of protein biochemistry within the Department of Applied Sciences at uh, Northumbria University. So there, there are several challenges facing the world today. I would say one of the um, most important is, is climate change and global warming. So the research that we're performing to address this challenge is to use enzymes and synthetic microorganisms to manufacture products in a more sustainable way. And we've uh, initiated a research project recently, um, which is referred to as the hub for biotechnology in the built environment, that will, we will use that research to generate uh, sustainable houses. So we bring our research into teaching in various modules, units within the courses that we teach. So some of these units are current topics in particular areas where staff engage the students with their current research. And we also have a final year project um, which will actually facilitate students working with staff in the actual areas that they're researching. So working with the staff's research team, the PhD students and postdocs that work with individual academics in a particular research group. So actually it is very stimulating for staff to work with students, undergraduate students and master students on research projects. Because often there are questions that we may not have come across before um, that, that actually we have to think about explaining certain areas of our research to these students. And actually it's not until you've explained something that you actually fully appreciate that topic area. So um, inter interacting with students is, um, is really important for, for staff. So I feel this benefits the students because of the level of engagement that they have. They're talking to staff that are um, very enthusiastic about the particular research that they're performing and the students are engaged at a really high level. They're performing experiments in the laboratory that is related to the member of staff's particular research topic. And often the data that's generated by these students in their undergraduate final year projects are used in research papers, research outputs, which are really important to the university. Okay, so that's the presentation um, from our um, from our lectures over at NU. So now let's go and take a look what our students are doing in the lab. And I can also give you a virtual tour of our labs. Okay. Oh, hi, Arif. Hi. So what are you doing today? Thank you. 
where we will do our final report. And then the last slide here is I see. Please follow me. Okay, uh, let's see what the students are up to. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at what Norishka is doing in the microbiology lab. So I am sitting uh, in front of the laminar flow cabinet and uh, a special feature of this cabinet is that it has a UVC germicidal lamp which helps maintain a sterile environment uh, throughout and this sterile environment is very important for any microbiological or cell culture work that you do. So today uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to be speaking some bacteria on my Ava plate. I have uh, recently just inoculated the uh, bacterial culture. Uh, yeah, so let's see how we do that. So before I start, I'm just going to spray my hands with some ethanol. So it's a bacterial culture. And I'm going to speak it at an angle. So I'm doing this very really gently to avoid any breaks in the eva. So once that's done, my speaking is done. So I'm actually going to place these in an incubator at 37 degrees and overnight to wait for my bacteria to grow. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lorishka, for sharing with us. Okay, so let's go over to the other lab. Okay. Hello, Kachin. Hi, guys. So, uh, let me start the first one. So, what is it? Oh. Okay. Hey, thank you, Kajin. Hey, bye bye. Okay, next we'll go over to Tanya and see what she's doing. Okay, so what I'm demonstrating is a technique known as gel electrophoresis. So this process is actually to separate millions of copies of DNA samples into various unique uh, bending patterns that can be visualized under UV light. So this is the setup. Here is a gel like a gel tank. This is the power source. And you notice inside the tank is actually loaded with this gel. So this gel is called um, agarose gel, which is somewhat similar to the agar agar that uh, we all eat. Okay. So you notice at the corner, along the corner here, there are a lot of little slot openings. These are called the wells. So what I will be doing is I'll be loading the DNA sample into the wells first before I start.
Okay, so because the gel is very fragile, so I must be very careful when I'm um, aspirating the sample inside the well. Otherwise, if I puncture the gel, the sample inside may actually leak out into the surrounding buffer and then this can affect the accuracy of the results. So I'll just position the tip above the well and then I'll keep my hand steady and I feel confident then I'll aspirate out and plunge the sample out. Okay, so now you see one well is already loaded with the sample. I'll be repeating it for all the other wells. And then once it's done, I will cover the tank. And I will connect the wires to the power source. And then I'll turn on the electricity. So once the electricity is turned on, uh, electricity will flow from the cathode to the anode. And then that is the time when the whole uh, process starts. And then you'll actually be able to see little bubbles running, uh, in, uh, emerging from both poles. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Tanya. Thank you. So the last station, we'll look at what Zui is doing. Hi, Zui, what are you doing? DNA samples, and you will calculate how many copies you have to make. So now I'm loading the samples into the machine. And okay, so for uh, analysis around two hours, you have to look how to do. Then from here, you can calculate how much of the original DNA was your sample. I see. Okay, thank you, Zui. Okay, so that concludes the end of our sharing session with the viewers at home. So I hope that you guys have gained a better understanding of um, SLS and what we have to offer. And hope that you'll sign up if, after this uh, today's session. Thank you, bye-bye. Dr. -bye. Eugene, I'm sorry. Yes. I would like to, well, please allow us to introduce ourselves because oh, we are- Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay. It's okay. Where are their consultants? My name is Richie. Good afternoon, everyone. And this is my colleague, Stagnosa. Two of, hello. Two of us will be assisting all your applications. And today, thanks for joining us. And I would like to inform all of you guys that we're offering the rebates for all applicants applying today. This is a special event, uh, virtual fair. We're doing it and we'll be ending very soon at 6 p.m. this evening. So if you are joining, if you are considering and studying with us, please apply as soon as possible before evening. You will be getting enjoyable rebate. It's the exclusive rebate. We have different types of rebate we're offering now. Um, you can enjoy for a foundation diploma program up to 800, degree program 4,000, master program 5,000. But we also have another government recovery grant for the students. So it's either one will be uh, offering, offering you the rebate. For degree students, you can get benefits of 5,000 rebates. And uh, for foundation diploma student, it's still the same 800. But for the details of the rebate and full program details, we would like to give you the consultation. So please contact us. Uh, but again, my name is Richie and this is Sinosa. Our contacts will be sharing to you guys as soon as possible. We'll be assisting you your consultation, application, and until to enrollment, we'll, we will be supporting you in any, any way. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm so glad you are, so, you are here. Thank you. Thank you.